Hello, everyone. As you make your way in, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, looks like we have about four minutes until our start time. So just hang tight and we will begin shortly. If you don't mind, though, drop us a line in the chat. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat option and let us know where you're joining from. Um, that's always fun to see. So I'm going to mute myself and then I'll check back in here in a moment. So I've seen Florida, Milwaukee, Las Vegas, Texas, Georgia, Minnesota. Snow is melting there. You know, it's a warm day here. I'm in St. Louis, and it's been chilly, but today it is pretty warm. Stephanie, where are you from today? I am from Northern Virginia today. And it has been very chilly this last week. Beautiful day in Montana, Hawaii, Idaho. Very good. If you've just joined us, we're just about another two minutes. We're going to start right at the top of the hour. So you'll see some things going on in the background. Feel free to jot that down. Uh, just some information, some useful links. Otherwise, we're going to get started here shortly. Someone from the frozen north in Anchorage, Alaska. One place I've never been. Will you email us the PowerPoint? I already had a question come in. Um, we actually don't have a PowerPoint today. I can email you what's playing in the background, though. That won't be a problem if you're interested. There's some useful links and stuff in there. <clears throat> So let's just say, uh, yes, I will email everyone after we finish with something, something useful. And we'll go with that. All right, it is the top of the hour. So we are going to begin. I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Robin, I'll be hosting. You're just gonna hear from me for a little bit at the beginning, at the end, before I turn it over to the experts. Um, but before we do that, I've got a few questions I'd like to ask everyone. So here in just a moment, you should see some polling questions pop up in front of you. Um, and if you don't mind taking just a moment to answer those, it will give us a good idea of who we have with us today, who we have in the room with us. And the first question is, who are you affiliated with? Uh, industry, federal government, state or local government, or other? <clears throat> Do you currently have, well, looks like most of us are with industry. That's fantastic. Uh, we welcome you from wherever you're coming from today. Do you currently have any active GSA contracts? Yes, we do. We have in the past, but not currently, or no, we've never had a contract of any type. And that's split pretty much across the board, so that's good. Not a prerequisite for being here by any means, um, just good to know. How much experience do you have in the federal marketplace? <clears throat> Excuse me. Zero, I don't know what any of this means. Rookies just getting started, a few years, getting the hang of it. Or pros, we've been doing this a long time and we're fairly even distribution there too, and that's good. So no matter where you're at in this journey, um, 
I think you're going to gain something from participating in today's webinar. Business size small, other than small or NA, if this doesn't apply to you, and majority of us are small, which makes sense. Okay, I can see most of us have had an opportunity to submit those answers, so I really appreciate you doing that. I still see people are still coming in, letting us know where they're coming from. Uh, fantastic, I love seeing that. I'm gonna end the poll now. There we go, Fan thank you for taking a moment fill that out. Uh, so on your screen, you should see a couple different options. Uh, the most important one I would like to draw your attention to is the Q&A. So if you have questions, once we dive in, feel free to type them in during into the Q&A pod. And we'll do our best to either address them in writing or verbally um, at the conclusion of today's webinar or towards the end or whenever Stephanie wants to. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to hand it over to our expert and our presenter for the day, Miss Stephanie Shutt. Great. Thank you, Robin, and thank you everyone who has joined us today. As Robin stated, there are two pods. We have the chat pod and the Q&A pod. So if you have the chat pod open but not the Q&A pod, I would suggest that you either close the chat or you can leave it open, but open up that Q&A um, pod as well. Now, this presentation is going to be focused mainly for prospective or new contract holders. Um, this is, we're going to go through a lot of information for that. But to kick it off, um, I'm going to go through some of the resources and uh, mainly the screens that you will see as a new um, prospective offer. So what you're going to see on here is um, the mass roadmap. And this, the shortcut to this area is gsa.gov backslash mass roadmap. It's actually on those slides that Robin had, but this is a really great website to know whether you're a new contractor or an existing contractor. This is where you're gonna find all of the information, specifically templates related to um, what you're doing in the mass program. One of the first things that I do recommend everyone do before you get on contract or before you expand your contract into a new area is browse this first tab, which is the prospective schedule contractors. Is schedules a good fit for me? You can substitute that with, is this new SIN a good fit for me? And these are some of the things that you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself related to this. Um, this corresponds to things in our vendor education center, which is one of the tasks that you must complete to get on contract. And that's the readiness assessment. And that readiness assessment is something that helps you understand what that market is. So you're not coming in blind. So this whole um, presentation that we're going to go through is really going to be looking into these websites, the top websites that you're going to need for um, getting on contract or if you are updating your contract. So on the first one, is it a good fit for you? It's going to kind of go through some of the information that you may want to look into um, when you're deciding whether or not to join the federal market. So the federal market isn't great for everyone. Mass isn't great for everyone. It does work for quite a lot of people, um, but it definitely is something that um, is different based on the type of work you do. Typically in the government, we have two types of contracting. We have commercial-based contracting and non-commercial-based contracting. For those of you guys who have worked in the government sector and perhaps not in mass, non-commercial type contracting is what we call cost reimbursable contracting. This is gonna be what's called cost plus, cost plus fee, um, anything in this kind of realm, which basically is a contract where you can have reimbursable items on that contract. In the commercial world, which would be MASS, the multiple award schedules contract, is a purely commercial contract. So it only allows certain types of contracting on that. It's gonna be firm fixed price, um, or more commonly known in the commercial world as a lump sum um, quote, to for a request for quote. It could be labor hour or time and materials. So this means that it's going to be based on how many labor hours you need. This would go more into the specifics of what you're going to be offering in there, or it can be direct purchase through a purchase card. And this is something where you would buy something as you would do in your personal life, um, 
you may do that on Amazon. For the federal government, we do that through Advantage. So this is a type of information that we do through the mass contract. So if you work in the government sector, but you find yourself doing more non-commercial, that cost reimbursable, mass may not be a good fit for you, but there may be other vehicles that will be a good fit for you. And I do welcome you to definitely go ahead and research those different vehicles. There are some restrictions in the mass program. For example, we do not allow any type of architecture and engineering types. So that architecture engineering called A&E is, is not allowed on the mass contract as well as construction. Construction is not allowed, especially construction as a total solution. We have random bits of um, fixing things where like roofers, different things like that, but you can't be constructing a full building or something like that or designing a full building. Um, on the mass program. So if you're in that realm, I know that we had quite a few companies in the construction world that had um, emailed more recently. So just so you guys know that that um, is not something that we would be doing in mass. That would be more in that non-commercial realm. So after you decide whether or not that your, your company is proposing or would be selling and you feel like, yes, this is a great fit for mass, then you'll need to also understand one of the big things, which is the cost of mass. So getting on contract, any government contract is a costly situation. It costs time. It's going to have, um, you're going to have to put money into it, and then you're going to have to maintain it, which also has that time in there as well. So it's not something that I would recommend for anyone who is just getting this just so they have it. You definitely want it if it's something you can use it. There are some um, performance compliance that you must adhere to within the contract. Um, things such as the Trade Agreements Act, and that's related to specifically products, but also where your company is headquarters. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, there's also things like we will be checking for your um, pricing so the pricing that you negotiate, ensuring that the pricing that your charges matches to that. And to stay on contract, you also must have um, $25,000 worth of reportable sales. And we track that because when you do get on contract, when you negotiate your pricing, we do negotiate with you to add a 0.75 fee on top of either your unit price for labor categories or in your product price or solution price. So that when you charge this to agencies, you will then report what you've um, invoiced out to agencies and then you will pay that IFF. So whatever that reporting is, it needs to be over $25,000 um, worth of sales that needs to come in every year. So there's a lot of different little things that go on with this contract. Again, this is not something to do um, on a whim, this is not something to do just so you can have it. This is something if you really feel that this is, you wanna be in this part of market. Usually we recommend that you work within the federal market first. And if you have agencies that are requesting you move to mass, that's when you would go ahead and get a mass contract as well. There is on this page, um, other paths, whether that be subcontracting or going to the new beta.sam.gov and looking for just open, um, solicitations that are out there that have work in them, all of this is something that you can definitely go for. Um, you can use um, the MASS program to look for partners that you could subcontract to if that's something that you are also interested in. If you do decide to go forward with a MASS offer, um, the best place to start going to is here, which is this Get Ready tab. And it's gonna go through the different things that you're gonna to wanna to do. You need to train, register, and understanding the solicitation, the forms you're gonna to need to do, and then finalizing that offer. And you will put all of these documents in our e-offer system. So as you go down through this whole get ready um, thing, it will go through all the various um, places that you need to go. You'll see on here these gray lines when you hit the plus sign, this is going to take you through this iconology. Um, where you're going to find it, if you have any, um, if you have any questions related to it, if it costs you any money, so like this is free to take these courses, um, 
and what you need to do and how you're going to need it for your offer. So these four icons will kind of step you through everything related to that. Um, you'll need to register your DUNS number in SAM.gov. Um, so that means you need to get a DUNS number for Dun & Bradstreet, and then you're going to need to register that in SAM.gov before you do this as well. Uh, you'll need a digital certificate to start your offer. We are moving away from digital certificates. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're hoping for um, early spring of 2021 to move to a multi-factor rather than the digital certificate, but we are moving first by the end of this month, early December, to DocuSign. So for anyone on here who has a mass contract, we are moving to DocuSign inside of eOffer eMod. And what that means is just like any other platform, when you go into eOffer eMod, when you get to the point where you need to sign, um, when you uh, click on the document, a DocuSign top thing will come up and it will say, do you want to adopt the signature and these initials for you going forward? And then it will remember that going into so the first time you use it, you'll say if you want to adopt those or if you want to input your own. And then you'll just click on the boxes that you need to sign. So this will all be inside the application. You're not going to need to download anything. It will be in there when you click on the document, it will automatically come up. So there's no need to download. It's just to let you know you won't need to digitally sign through your digital certificate in eOffer eMod starting at the beginning of December. So that's something to just make sure everyone is aware of for that. Um, we will still have the digital certificate to get you into eOffer eMod until spring of next year. And that's when we'll move into the MFA or the multi-factor authorization, which for those of you guys who are already on contract is the FAST ID. You'll be familiar with it if you are in eBuy, the sales reporting portal or the mass mod portal. Note that if you already have a FAST ID because you currently access eBuy, the fast sales reporting portal, or um, the mass mod portal, you will use that exact same email password to get into eOffer eMod in the spring when we switch over. The same thing goes for those three websites. Don't re-register your email multiple times and get new passwords. Just do it once. So anytime you come into this multi-factor where you need to do an email and a password and it's going to email you a one-time passcode, you're gonna be using the same email and the same password for that. And then you'll update your password um, when it tells you you should get an email related to that of when you need to update it. I believe it's every 90 days, but it could be every 60. I'd have to recheck on that. So we have all of that in there. Um, so we have, and all of the things that are going on with that. Um, I see that we do have a question in the chat. Just be aware that if, please make sure you write your question in the Q&A box, not the chat box so that we can answer it um, for that. So there are a couple of programs, and this is something else we also get a lot of questions on, related to companies that are smaller, that are newer, especially brand new companies or companies that are joint ventures. Joint, we have a lot of joint ventures right now. If you are a new company where you do not have the two years of past performance for your specific company, or you do not have the financial two years requirement um, or the five year, the two years corporate experience, it's all two years, because um, your company has not been around for two years. The only way to get on mass without the two years is to go through the startup springboard program. And you can only do the startup springboard program if you are um, doing a full offer and only utilizing an offer in the IT category. So with that, one of the things I wanted to show you guys really quick is if you go into beta.sam, and I did wanna show you guys this. So we refreshed our solicitation every couple of months if you get here and you see this, click here, because there may be a new one, always click here to get the most recent version of the solicitation because it does, um, if you have an old link, that's what will happen. But when you go in here and you're deciding what to offer against, um, the full solicitation is here. 
This solicitation document is going to be something that you're going to want to download. You're going to want to read all of it. This is the stuff that's going to apply to every single offerer. So if you're a new contractor or you're an existing contractor and you happen to be new to the program or you happen to be new to that contract, I would recommend that you at least download the solicitation and review it, um, even if you skim it, just so you know and you're aware of things. Then what you're gonna do is look through all these different categories. The categories is where they have the specific offerings. So as I said, the startup springboard, if you have under two years, you can only have stuff from the information technology category. You cannot have any offerings that fall into any of these other categories if you're gonna go through that. So just be aware that um, that if you don't have the two years, it can only be in the information technology category. But this is where you're gonna go through and find all the information related to your category. This is going to include what we call our large categories, our subcategories, and then further um, categorization down to what we call our special item numbers. And these are the numbers that you guys are gonna select when you decide what you're gonna put your offer against for. So when you are putting your offer together under the get ready, the next thing after you've read that solicitation, you're gonna go into here and you're gonna look at all the templates. So you're gonna see the templates are either going to be for if you're offering products or services and training. If you're offering both products and services and trainings, you're gonna have both of these templates that you're gonna to need to download. And then you're gonna have SIN specific templates. So you're gonna look at these special item numbers and you're gonna see if you have any of these on your offering. And if you do, you're gonna to wanna to download those templates. If you need an agent authorization letter, you're going to download that from there. Um, and then if you, um, your past performance questionnaire. So for past performance, you have two options for past performance. Uh, you used to have three. There used to be an open ratings report that was done through Dun & Bradstreet. That was retired last December. And um, as of this December, uh, all of them should have been completed because the open ratings are only good for one year. So if you do have an open ratings, please be aware that it will expire um, one year after it's issued. So, if you've not had that and you have uh, federal government work that you've done in the past, chances are you have what's called CPARS, contractor past performance. And if you have CPARS, you can list the three CPARS um, based on your DUNS number, but they must be associated to your DUNS number. You must be the prime, on, prime contractor on the CPARS. You can't be a subcontractor on that. It's got to be assigned to you as a company. If you don't have CPARS or you've never heard of CPARS or you've never gotten an email about it, chances are you don't have it. <clears throat> and the next thing you would do is this past performance questionnaire. What you're going to do is you're going to download between three and five and you're going to email out to your customers and you're going to have them fill it out. You're going to take those and you're going to upload them into eOffer with your offer. That way, and then you're going to also have a document that's going to explain each of the past performance that you've updated. So you're gonna explain what the project was, what work you did on it, and that kind of information, so that if the contracting officer needs to validate it with the company, that that is the past performance and it's correct, they have a little bit more information to go off of instead of just guessing um, what you did at that um, company or customer. If you are providing products, you will need to do the letter of supply. If you're providing services, you will not. Um, and then, for those contractors who are in phase three or contractors who are getting their secondary contract or a follow-on contract, you will need to do the request to hold continuous contracts. And this is so that you can have multiple contracts at the same time. There's a bunch of other information in here and then you're gonna see this templates that are very specific by the categories. So you're gonna need like IT, there'll be a bunch of stuff in here as well. So this is something that you're gonna wanna go through in detail for that. Um, so you'll finish with assembling your offer and finalizing the offer and you'll go through all of those different things. While you're doing this and you're getting prepared to go into e-offer and you will need to get that digital cert if you're planning to submit before we change over to the multi-factor, which will again will not happen until spring of next year. 
you can go while you're getting ready to go and put everything in another place to go is this e offer emod help center so in this e offer emod help center on this table of contents if you go into here it will have preparing an e offer but below it it will also have the emod so for those of you guys who are contractors if you're not sure what the screens look like and you want to be more prepared this is a great place for you to go and review stuff um, what it will look like when you go into here, for example, let's click on adding your negotiator. It will go through the various screens that you're going to need to fill out and it will give you helpful hints and what you need to actually do. This way, uh, you guys will be prepared because in eOffer, a lot of this information like these helpful hints are not actually in the system. So having this available will help you go through um, a lot of those screens. So another question that we get, especially for new contractors and existing contractors, is related to the Vendor Education Center readiness assessment. As I stated earlier, the readiness assessment is a really great way to understand the market, whether you're adding a new special item number or whether you are doing a schedule for the very first time. Um, I did wanna let everyone know, over here on this top right, there's VAM Ready Report. These are the numbers for your readiness assessment. And all you're going to have to do um, once it uploads is just select the SIN that you would like to have happen. I think my internet connection is a little faulty today. But what you'll go in here is you'll just, so if you wanted to do um, your SIN that you're looking at, um, say nothing on there. And let's say you wanted to do four, let's pick, let's see if something comes up with that. So let's say you're doing this one, and this is an actual, a legacy sin, rather one of the new ones. But if you go into here, once you collect this, this will all change to show the number of contractors that were in there, um, how many have zero sales, all of that kind of information. So. All those questions on that readiness assessment are in these screens. So that's something that rather than trying to build it yourself, if you just wanna go right here to this ready report, that will help you get through that as well. So the last thing I do wanna show you guys on the roadmap is under schedule contractors. So under the schedule contractors, this is everything for post award. This is everything you would need after you've been awarded a contract. You have the welcome package, which is gonna go through um, the information, whether it be the checklist, your time sensitive guidance, whatever that may be, um, tips related to marketing and different things like that. Um, you're gonna to wanna to go through this just to make sure you know what you're in charge of for your compliance. Underneath the welcome package is the contracting report requirements and modification guide. Right now, this very top area, it has information for COVID, for the coronavirus. Right now, we've loosened some of our requirements for products specifically in the PPE arena for COVID, and that's removing the trade agreements um, restrictions and also essentially the same items in which a group um, ability one would pr provide on their procurement list. So uh, if you guys are current contractors and you provide PPE, this would be something um, you would do. If you are not a current contractor and you're trying to get on schedule just for PPE, due to the volatility of this market, I would strongly suggest that you find a prime that you can contract, subcontract with and have them and sell through them. It will just make everything easier for you. The next thing we have in here that we just released and emailed out to everyone is the modification and mass modification guidance. So this is gonna go through all of your information. One of the things we did, because we did get the, uh, back a lot of comments related to the most recent um, mass mod, what did it say? How do I know? Where do I go for information? So we did put the most recent um, significant changes um, in this page so you guys will be able to find them. Under the modifications, this modification guide will be your best friend. I recommend that you download it, you have it, you read it. Um, if you are a contractor in phase three, it will give you guidance how to do the streamlined modifications to move SINs from one contract to another contract. 
But with that, those are the top things I wanted to go about for prospective contractors and contractors who are pretty new. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues so we can start going through some of the Q&A um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. My name is Colby Sheffer. I'm the Director of Stakeholder Engagement for the MAPS program. And thank you to so many of you who have joined us here today. We have 375 participants on the line and uh, many open questions, which is so exciting. Uh, but seeing as we only have until three o'clock, uh, we will be going through these as fast as possible. Uh, please understand if we do not get to your question, uh, you are always welcome to email us directly at masspmo at gsa.gov if your question is not answered either directly or in one of Stephanie's remarks. Okay, so we'll begin. First question, what's the format the offer needs to be in? So um, the format for the offer is going to uh, be based on what you're offering. So really it's going to be dictated by the e-offer system. It's not a document like you would be doing for an RFQ because we're setting up a large IDIQ in which multiple agencies will be ordering against. And that kind of information will be um, when you have formatting and different things like that will be at the order level, not for this. What you're going to do is you're going to complete all the templates and information and then go into the e-offer system or e-mod system. And as you walk through the process, you will upload various documents into the system to submit your offer. But there isn't a formatting specific situation. Next question. The latest released mod guidance with updates, updates for phase three of mass consolidation directs vendors to support pricing when offerings are added as part of mass consolidation from a non-surviving contract to a surviving one. If the vendor already has established pricing on one of its other contracts and plans to move those LCATs to the surviving mass contract, are they required to renegotiate the pricing. So um, what you're going to need to do in there, you will need to submit some pricing documentation, um, A, to figure out if your pricing is new, but also uh, if your pricing was different on your various contracts. So one of the things I did not get into was um, how you guys negotiate or come to market in the offering system. We actually have two different ways. Uh, we have commercial sales practice or we have the transactional data reporting. If you have one contract in TDR or transactional data and one contract in commercial sales practicing, that may cause a need to reevaluate your pricing because you're changing those terms and conditions when you bring it over to the new contract. Another thing, if you have commercial sales practice across the boards for all of your contracts and you're moving one over, if that commercial sales practice is not the same on every single contract, you may need to renegotiate your pricings as well, or you may need to renegotiate your basis of award or how your contract was awarded with that commercial sales practice. So those are some of the reasons that you're gonna have to do those. We typically always do um, a pricing renegotiation and reevaluation to determine and revalidate that that contract is fair and reasonable any times it changes. So you will need to provide that documentation, but we did remove things like the project experience requirement because we know that you can provide them. We're more just making sure that the pricing is in sync. And that's gonna be good for you as a company as well as the government because you don't want different pricing situations going on um, in one contract. Next question, where would someone find security camera installation under the new mass structure? So the best thing to do is to go into um, GSA eLibrary. If you go into GSA eLibrary and you go into the security category, you'll be able to see the different special item numbers that are on there. I believe there is one that's security um, installation or security systems which are in there um, in security services. So you're gonna look through those, you'll look through the 
um, definitions of them and see which is the best fit for you. Um, if none of them fit specifically on there, um, you can um, opt to add either ancillary services or you can opt to use those as um, the order level material side. But I believe we do have under the security large category, there are security services in which you could put insulation through. Next question. Do you have to read through the entire document for each schedule slash large category to find out exactly what you need and where are the templates to demonstrate what information is needed? For example, I'm trying to find a compliance letter and another checklist. So um, if you, um, and again, I see a lot of comments coming in under the um, comment section, make sure you put those questions in the Q&A. And so when you look at the bottom, there's gonna be a Q&A and then a chat. Make sure you put those in the Q&A so that we can track them. Um, so when you're going through the schedule, um, you don't need to read every large, category attachment. You just need to read the category attachment that applies to you. So when you look at that solicitation, you need to read the solicitation, the full solicitation that just says solicitation, and then you need to download whichever the large categories that you're going to do an offering under, whether it's furniture and furnishing, whether it's information technology, whether that's prof professional services, and you may have multiple large categories. So depending on how many you have, you'll download them, but you don't need to download all of them, nor do you need to download a category that um, has nothing to do with the offering that you have. When it comes to templates on that mass roadmap that I was showing at the beginning, there is that templates that you can go down. Um, when it comes to compliance documents, I'm not sure if you mean compliance or quality control. Um, your quality control is usually in your employee manual or handbook, and you'll put that in for that. Um, there isn't a template for quality control because it is different for each company. Um, and it would just be a Word document coming straight out of that manual. Um, if, it, if it's for um, products for TAA compliance, for Trade Agreement Act compliance, you'll use the letter of supply um, template. Um, but without further information of what specific type of compliance you're talking about, um, I would, I would need to know more. Next question. How do we incorporate multiple wage determination into a GSA schedule? We have heard one way to do this is to have the predominant wage determination be the basis of the GSA rates with other uh, wage determinations indexed or referenced in some manner as being incorporated into the schedule as well. Have you heard of this before? So every year we put out what the year wage determinations is going to be, you'll find it on that mass roadmap. Um, those will be the wage determination indexes that you will use for all your wages, um, for all your SEA, um, Service Contract Act employees, which I think is SCLS now. Um, what you'll do is you'll use the one, if you have multiples within there, um, just make sure you use the ones that are current to the current schedule. So the ones that are listed, um, you shouldn't be using ones that are not currently allowed on there. So I know that DOL over the years changes theirs. You're not gonna go off theirs. You're just gonna go off of whichever one is current on the schedule. We made a arrangement with DOL that the solicitation only needs to be updated once a year with those wage determination indexes. Okay, next question. Uh, can my company be under more than one schedule? For example, Schedule 70 and Schedule 84. Do I make an offer under each? So right now we don't have a Schedule 70 or an 84. We have retired both of those. We only have one schedule, the mass schedule, and that schedule covers both of those. Um, both of those legacy schedules are on there. So you actually don't need to pick, you can just go through the mass. Next question. When submitting an application for a new mass contract, are elements of the technical price or technical proposal, excuse me, evaluated on a pass-fail basis 
or are there specific evaluation criteria that we will be scored against? Um, it's more of a pass fail basis. Um, there's not a specific um, criteria that you're being scored against. What we're more looking for in that technical proposal is uh, validation that you guys can provide the offering that you stated, that you have the resources to provide it, that you have um, the equity to provide it and that kind of stuff. So it is more of a pass fail on that. Next question, let's say I have a US patented product that is COVID-19 certified. Is it more likely to get chosen from the GSA schedule? Do COVID-19 products get more priority now? If so, who do I talk to about that? So if you have an item that is COVID-19 specific, the best thing to do A right now is probably market it um, to agencies on your own, just because um, I don't, that market's going to become extremely more volatile and I don't want you waiting to get on contract. Um, it usually takes anywhere between 45 days is usually our shortest to get someone on contract and you have to have a very, um, you have to make sure we have a CO that is available to do that. Typically most contracts on average take anywhere between three and six months to get on. So I would say if you're thinking for an item that is that specific, I would either A, look at GSA eLibrary where we list all of our contractors, go through that and maybe find some partners in which you can be a subcontractor to and let the prime take care of the contract, that or market directly to the federal government. Next question, can you go over what changed in Refresh 5 for streamlining? For instance, do we need to still provide project experience and invoices, et cetera, when we are just moving our LCATs over to another schedule to consolidate? So you don't need to provide the project experience that was streamlined out. Um, and if you go into the modification guide, the very first thing in the Addison or add a uh, um, labor cat or product and things, it will tell you exactly what you don't need to do. Um, it's basically says you don't need to do this step in there. Um, but when it comes to pricing um, and invoicing, that is going to be um, based on what you're moving, what it was before, how long has it been since it's been updated, when was the last fair and reasonable done, is the price, is um, the terms and conditions different on the different contracts, which majority of the time they are. So you will be looking at submitting pricing information and having a fair and reasonable determination made. Next question, when can we anticipate contracting officer reassignments for phase three consolidation? So we have started this um, based on how, we have a lot of contractors that are in mid mod or mid information right now, or an option year. We have a lot of companies that are in option year modification right now. So if you have any modifications or anything going on, that's going to hold up moving your contract over. Um, what mainly needs to happen is uh, you can trigger it faster if you do fill out the Excel spreadsheet that we sent out with your checklist and you email it to both your COs. Um, that will allow the CO to complete a lot of their stuff more quickly so that they can move it to under one CO. Um, if one of your contracts has zero cells or low to no cells, um, or if both of your contracts have low to no cells, um, we will not be moving um, them over, we will be waiting to determine how, if you guys do get sales. Speaking of sales, do you need to have $25,000 in sales to be considered for a contract? So there's no way for us to know that, but you do need two full years of financial documents. We need to know that your company is solvent and we need to know that your profit loss ratio is equal to or higher than the average profit loss ratio for the NAICS code um, that you're applying for. So that's something, it's not a monetary, your company needs to just have $25,000 in the bank. It is, what is your financial determination for that company? CPARs are acceptable as past performance. How do we request that our government customers complete a CPARs for us? So the CPARs are based, if your order is over, um, the micro purchase threshold. So if you have an order that's under $10,000, 
the government does not need to issue a CPARS. But if you do have an order that is over $10,000 um, and it's been invoiced against, uh, then you can email the, con the um, customer agency that you worked with to ask them if they did enter a CPARS. You should have gotten an email if they did, um, and you should have been able to enter the system as a contractor to see those that are against your DUNS based on the emails that you received. Um, if they did not issue a CPARS, um, for some agencies that CPARS are not applicable, such as the Red Cross or FAA, that don't fall that don't actually need to follow the FAR. There may be some agencies in there that don't need to do actual CPARS. So it's always a good question to ask. Next question. We noticed that the Refresh 5 updated services and training PowerPoint introduces three new columns, V, W, and X, in the services pricing tab. However, no instructions are provided in the README tab about the purpose of those columns and what information is required to be provided there. Can you please clarify? So I would actually need to pull up the template to um, see that. Um, what we can do is if you want to send that to the mass PMO email box, we'd be more than happy to respond to that. But I would also recommend looking at the mass modification guidance as well. Next question. Did I hear you say mass is not applicable to A, A, and E slash S, E, T, A companies? Um, so mass is not applicable to A and E architecture engineering and specifically towards con construction and no construction. Is there a website that guides contractors on how to transition their legacy GSA contracts to mass? So what you would have gotten is a mass modification with your legacy contract that would you would have needed to sign. So if you go to eLibrary and you can find your contract on there, then you have already signed. If we have been in business for more than two years, is there another variable like revenue to get into this program? So if you've been in business for more than two years and you'd like to get in the program, as long as you have two years of financial, two years of corporate experience and um, two years of past performance, meaning you have at least three customers, those can be commercial, those can be federal, those could be state and local, they could be international customers. Um, as long as you have three, at least three customers who do past, and past performance, those are the main, uh, those are some of the main things that you're gonna need to go through for that. Next question, and maybe Robin can help us with this one. It's about uh, our session on October 15th that was on the Mass PMO's priorities for FY21. Is there a way to see that recording? Possibly. Um, why don't you, the best thing to do is to email uh, either myself or the MAS PMO and we can see um, if we can help you out. Thank you. But it is not posted publicly anywhere. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Next question. Do you know if DLA will issue a cage code to a company without requiring a SAM registration? It is necessary for our parent to have one for us to indicate in our SAM record that they are in our parent, that they are our parent, excuse me. Um, I am not sure. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how DLA determines that um, and how they determine the cage codes. So um, I would recommend that you contact DLA. How many invoices do you need for products? One for each product? For example, if I have 500 products, do I need 500 invoice representations for each? So depending on how you come to market with pricing for products is really what's going to determine how many invoices you need. Um, usually it's just a sampling. Um, if you have an invoice that has multiple products on there, that's going to be something that would be um, something that you can definitely um, do related to that. Um, that's something that um, I would recommend is don't do one invoice that only has one product on there. Um, typically what we do with products is most people go through the transactional data reporting pilot. They don't usually do a commercial sales practice um, 
where they only provide invoices if requests from the CO. And we run your pricing through a pricing tool that sees if you're in the average of where everyone else is horizontally. So um, that way we don't have to validate every by hand every single product. Can myself and another share a digital certificate or do we need, do we each need one to work on the application? So they only sell digital certificates to one person. Um, so you'd have to get each individual ones if you want to both access the system. If you don't care that both of you access the system, if just one of you needs to access the system and the other one is just helping put documents together, then you'll only need one for that. If we are just applying now, is it worthwhile getting a certificate? Also, if I am a CAC card holder, will that suffice? So uh, CAC cards are not recognized in EL for EMOD. Um, so if you are applying now um, and you want to get your application in before spring of next year, then you're going to need a digital certificate. If you want to wait till next spring to do it, then you can wait till then, but you can't access eOffer until you have that digital certificate. Are the CPARS reports only created for those who have an existing contract? It looks like they also may be created for those who have completed orders with GSA, which we have through various government entities such as DFAS. If so, how would we find out if we have existing reports as well as obtain copies of these reports? So um, if you've never received an email and you may want to talk to other people in your company to see if they have, um, that's the best way to determine if you have a CPARS. Again, if your orders are under the micro purchase threshold, you may not have a CPARS in there. Um, you want it to be for an order so that you can demonstrate your past performance in the thing. The best thing to do is maybe even contact that customer and just ask them if they put a CPARS in for you. Next question, are there any updates planned for SIP? Um, yes. So there is a group working on catalog management. Um, I don't know um, what their timeline is looking at. They're really looking at um, everything from the beginning to end related to catalog management. So um, we're hoping over the next two to three years, you'll be hearing more and more about that project. I want to access eOffer for the first time. I'm being asked to enter a PIN for the digital certificate, but I don't remember selecting a PIN. Have you encountered this before? So this would be based on your digital certificate. Um, if you're accessing eOffer for the first time, you must have a digital certificate and that PIN I believe is what aligns it to that digital certificate. If you're not sure and you have a digital certificate, you can either call the help desk at, um, that will be listed on the eOffer site, or um, you can contact the help desk for the person that has your digital certificate to see if they have the access for your PIN. Next question, which SIN should managed services offerings go to? Example, PC as a service. So the best thing, because um, I'm not sure what PC as a service stands for, um, but if you are not sure, the one thing that you can do is look up um, competitors to see where they are on the schedule and what SIN they're using to determine that. Um, but if you, for managed services, I would assume would be under professional services, I would download that attachment and read through it. For office supplies under the OS4 schedule, do we have the option to quote FOB origin pricing for Kona shipments? Um, I'd have to look at that uh, attachment. So if the attachment says in the OS4, I believe it says that you have to have FOB destination pricing for Kona shipments, but I would check on that attachment. The attachment should state if there is that restriction. If it doesn't state that, then you would make that known in eOffer. Next question, can we still use Startup Springboard even if we have more than two years of corporate experience? 
So if you have more than two years corporate experience, I'm not sure why you would use Startup Springboard. Startup Springboard is um, rather than using your company's experience, you use the experience of people in your company. You still have to have all the same documents. You don't get out of those documents. It's just using a different way of looking at them. Um, it is usually much harder than the normal way. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't recommend using Startup Springboard if you have two years of experience because a CEO will also ask you why you used it. Next question, when you say we can't have any other categories, do you mean we can't have any other NAICs or PSCs listed? We have more than just IT. So that's only if you're doing Startup Springboard. If you're not doing Startup Springboard, you can list any special item numbers that you need, whether that be in information technology, whether that be in the professional services category, wherever that may be, um, you can definitely do so. Um, if you are doing Startup Springboard though, you just need to only list those SINs that are in that IT category. Next question, regarding past performance, our firm only has one CPARS, not three, as indicated in section A of the instructions to offerers. Can we submit a combination of that and other customer references to sat satisfy that requirement? So if you don't have the three, then you really need to, um, uh, if you don't have the three CPARS, then you really just need to use the three customer surveys um, from the past performance questionnaire. Regarding CPARS, can a tribal 8A company reference sister or subsidiary CPARS in past performance? Um, not if it has a different DUNS number. If it has a different DUNS number, you can't use it. If, if the mass contract has ended, do we treat the mass submission as a totally new application or is there an option to update? If your contract has ended and you do not have a live GSA mass contract, then you will have to do it um, from beginning. Um, you will not be able to streamline anything. Do you see PARs for individual years of an IDIQ count as one CPAR? Um, so it depends. If they issue specific CPARs for specific orders against the IDIQ, then you would let you can list the unique ones for the specific orders against the IDIQ. If they're just listing one for the IDIQ every year, um, you're going to want to have different ones than just those because it demonstrates that you have different customers. Okay, forgive my delay. I'm also trying to type answers since we still have 72 open questions. So know that um, we're going to get through a couple more. If yours is a repeat and has been answered already, great. If not, please save them and email them to us at masspmo at gsa.gov and we will do our best over the next couple of days to get back to you. So thank you so much for your patience and for your really um, high participation and engagement today. So next question, can you explain the use of experience of principles as a substitute for past performance? So um, if you have principles that work with your company that have strong past performance, from um, other companies um, that they did, whether you're using it for the project experience side or you're using it for your past performance, um, you will do a write-up of this and explain that past performance in there and explain their things. Um, I would recommend that you only do this um, if you cannot get three customer um, past performance questionnaires filled out. Will the recording of this webinar be available? I can handle that one. So uh, we, I've answered this in the chat as well um, a few different times, but uh, we are recording this um, as everyone can see and it was announced on the invite as well. We will make a decision afterwards whether or not we share it publicly. And if so, it will be posted on GSA's YouTube channel. Thank you, Robin. 
Next question. When I look on beta SAM for contracting opportunities, I get too many results, including contracts from years ago. How do, specific, how do I specifically reduce the results to only contracts that are currently going out to bid? So if you look on the left-hand side of beta.sam.gov, there is a bunch of filters. In those filters, there will be ones related to the start and end date. So um, what you're going to want to do is um, go and change those filters so that you can minimize it down to uh, what that is in there, but definitely start looking through those filters. Next question, I am a sub on a project at a government agency. We don't have CPARs, but can we use this as past performance and provide contact of government official overseeing our work? So you can, but you're gonna have to do it through the past performance questionnaire. So if the agency is willing to do a past performance questionnaire for you, um, you can do that. You cannot use the CPARs that is designated for the prime because it will not match your DUNS number. Next question, when is SIP going away and is there, will there be a change to a more modern interface? Um, that's gonna be dependent on that catalog management project. At this point, we don't have a date for that. Next question, we have a mass schedule contract that is expiring January 31 of 2021. Do we apply for a whole new contract or are we trying to get a renewal on the existing one? So it depends if you're, if the t January 31st, 2021 date is the 20th year of your contract, then you're gonna need to go into e-offer and start a new contract. However, because you have a current contract in place, as long as you submit prior to January 31st, 2021, you would um, be able to do a streamlined offer, which would remove um, those requirements of past performance, corporate experience, um, uh, the Vendor Education Center Readiness Assessment, there's a bunch of them that you can look on the roadmap. Now, if you're in year four or five of your contract, then you will just do an option modification, which you should have already gotten. But if you've already done, exercised your three options and you're at the 20 year, you will need to go into e-offer. Now, if you go into e-offer after January 31st, you're gonna have to submit as if a brand new contractor with no past contract. And this may be our last question. So thank you again, folks, for all the questions. We know there are many in the queue still. Uh, so thank you, thank you again so much. If it has not been answered already, please send us an email and we will get right to you directly. Uh, we have a very um, fast turnaround time on that email. So no worries there. So our final question for today, how early does GSA allow, uh, as in what year of the contract, us to submit a new offer for our continuous contract. I've heard year 14 and on. Yep. So there isn't actually a specific date that says that you have to, that you can't do it earlier. You can do it as early as you want. That's why we have that continuous contract notification template that I showed. Um, we recommend at year 14 uh, just so that there's no confusion, also because it takes a lot of time to get on contract. So we recommend at year 14 because most BPAs are five years. Now, if you are in facilities where you are facing 10-year BPAs, then you will start your next contract at year nine. But with that, um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for the great questions. Um, I'm sorry we were not able to get through all of them. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and a wonderful um, holiday season. Absolutely. And I echo that. I just want to say, uh, take a moment to say thank you to everyone that took time out of your day to participate. Thank you to our team here uh, of experts that did a fantastic job as well. Um, hopefully you're able to write down that email. Um, if not, I'm going to email everyone that attended afterwards with some good information um, about what we talked about today and the things that could help you along, along your journey. With that being said, uh, everyone stay safe. Be kind to one another and have a great rest of your day. This concludes the webinar.